So I think I got very interested in all of this kind of YouTube stuff when COVID hit. So back in the end of February, uh, beginning of March 2020, it wasn't clear at all how significant that pandemic was going to be and or the, the response. And so I think naturally there was a, an overly cautious reaction in those first couple of weeks. And so the fraternity itself closed its offices during that time because we just weren't sure. Um, we couldn't really trust the information that was out there. Um, and it didn't look like anybody had any particular answers. And so safer than sorry for the first couple of weeks. Uh, that meant that largely in my own apostolate, after I had said my office and done my holy hour and said mass for the, the community, there was nothing else to do. Um, and so I started kind of trolling YouTube, looking for just interesting things, mainly lectures um, on topics that I was interested in. And I stumbled across two people, um, Sir Roger Scruton, who was an English philosopher who died at the turn of the year. And I think that had promoted a lot of his material to the kind of top of the YouTube list, um, who was an incredibly, it seems, engaging and far-sighted man who reminded me very much of Dr. McInerney, who was our philosophy teacher at Our Lady of Guadalupe Seminary in Nebraska. It was very gently persuasive, um, very, very compelling, logically, very Aristotelian, and very based on a kind of practical sense of the human being. Um, and I think Scruton will probably go down as being England's probably best philosopher of the 20th century, 21st century. Um, because I think everything that he identified that was wrong with society is wrong with society. And I think his answers are in fact real answers. Smaller communities, a sense of national identity, a sense of the true, the good and the beautiful. In people's lives. All things that we're taught in seminary, but you don't see reflected in society at any level very often. And so when you do, you kind of latch on to it. So I started to look for him. Um, and I also then found in looking for him, a conversation that he'd had with Dr. Jordan Peterson over the nature of the truth and the good. And that was fascinating because they're approaching it from completely different points of view. Scruton's very much more, I don't think he would say he's an Aristotelian, but it's very much more on that kind of metaphysical level. Whereas Peterson's approaching it from a psychological point of view, what makes the person tick, as opposed to what would be the best framework in the abstract. And I thought there was a real coming together of, of, of minds. It was a very difficult interview to follow or discussion to follow because at times they're coming at it almost at cross purposes. Um, but that got me interested in, in, in Peterson and kind of put him on, on my map a little bit. And I've looked at a number of videos that he's done, some on the self-help front, which I think if you're a young man between 21 and 35, you should be watching Jordan Peterson on his self-help because he speaks truth. He speaks, he says exactly the same things that I say to most of you in the confessional. Get a life, get a purpose to your life, break your life down into stages and take responsibility for it and you will be happier. Uh, and I think that resonates with lots and lots of young people, particularly young Catholics today, who have found themselves so disenfranchised from society at so many different levels, politically, sociologically and religiously. I think they're looking for something and they don't even know what it is that they're looking for. And that feeds an inner angst and an inner depression, a kind of pointlessness. We're on the cusp of a new nihilism. 
which of course, if we remember our history correctly, is the thing that creates a new Marxism. <laughs> so we're starting to see a repetition of cycles that we've seen before and not that long ago. And, and that's quite troublesome, I think, for a society that claims to be so well developed to be making the same mistakes again within two or three generations. Uh, where, you know, Schultz and Istin was the proof of Dostoevsky, we're now living out that whole scenario again. So I was interested in, in, in Dr. Peterson and I, I really kind of started to pay attention to what he said and I liked it. And I also got the impression that he too was searching for something. I think he's, a, I think he's quite, he tries to be like, a, I think we all should, an honest intellectual endeavorer. He asks questions of himself and he tests those against his knowledge. I don't think he would ever claim to have the fullness of the truth. He just looks and says, well, this works in this situation and it has worked from time immemorial because human beings are wired like that. And so to deviate from that is to deviate from your own nature. And I thought that was quite an impressive thought. And out of that, I think, comes this quest for self-improvement, at least intellectual improvement. Can, can my knowledge be made more applicable in people's lives? And I think that's largely speaking what drives him to do what he has been doing for the last three or four years, making all these YouTube videos on, from everything from self-help to the big lecture scene in an attempt to try and communicate what he knows, but also then to hear the reaction to that in order to continue to develop his ideas. That's impressive, uh, that someone's prepared to be as honestly transparent and openly transparent and, and intellectually honest as that. You don't get that very often. And within that sense of honesty, was, I think, a genuine quest, question in his own mind, to study the Bible, to look at Scripture, and to ask questions of Scripture in a way that I haven't seen done before. Because he's not approaching it from a religious point of view. I think there is, I think he can't escape the fact that he has some cultural or historical connection to a Christian setting. I think he would, he would agree with that, that he very much considers himself to be a product of Christianity, if in fact not a believer in it, but a product. But he doesn't look at scripture, or at least the, the, the videos that I've seen recently, he doesn't look at scripture from a point of view as a dogma that's received by a divinity that's been given to us as a set of rules to live our life. He sees them more as the, the psychological import of scripture on the human being, no matter where it comes from. And he often doubles back on himself with this idea of consciousness. Consciousness doesn't come to human beings from something that belongs to them. It's given to them somehow. Now, Within a Catholic understanding, we would say that, yes, it's given to you by God. Mm -hmm. That is the ensoulment of whatever clay was formed by God's hands in the Garden of Eden. And once it's self-conscious, bad things start to happen because pride would have entered in there and an unknowing mistake gets made about where our place is in creation. And I think he challenges that quite well, and I think he articulates it quite well, this, this idea that the, particularly the Pentateuch, those first five books of, of Holy Writ, represent a kind of archetype, a mythological story, he would say, um, like a Homeric narrative that 
allows or has allowed Christianity to not only survive, but you know, in one sense of the word, to conquer, to transmit itself and to create a virtue system that is really based on who the human being is. Because those, whether the characters themselves existed, I don't think uh, Dr. Peterson goes into at all. I don't think he's even interested in that. But there is a type of Adam in all of us. There is a type of Adam who is conscious and has self-consciousness and who has a capacity to name things. But because his consciousness leads him to places that he's not supposed to go, he is tainted. There is something wrong with him. And I think in the introductory lecture, he spends, I think he's quite funny about it, he doesn't actually open the book of Scripture. He spends almost an hour and a half talking about what it takes to understand this Homeric narrative, uh, which I think is quite funny that he predates Scripture in some way with that a kind of understanding about the human being. But Scripture is the thing that tells us how the human being is. But within that, I think that psychological approach to understanding scripture or its application is where I think Dr. Peterson has a real contribution to make to modern culture. And I've seen this re-emphasized and, and used in certain different ways by other more contemporary authors, particularly um, people like Douglas Murray and or even Roger Scruton to articulate man's basic conceptual needs of himself and his surroundings. And that came to the fore with the, the Brexit argument and with now the uh, culture war that's raging in, in, in some US cities about identity politics. You know, why is it unhealthy for us to put people into little boxes and to take what is a very sometimes unpleasant but unique social construct, which is the human being and his social interactions with everybody else, and then to try and distill out of that all of the good stuff to just leave all of the negative stuff. Why is that good for the human being? You know, why is it good for our psychology on an individual level, and why is that? so harmful to society on a, on a supranational level, like the European Union or uh, national politics. And I think Dr. Peterson has done a lot of work to try and articulate that, that there's, within the human being, there is a big part of us that wants to feel safe and secure. We like that security, we, we need that security because without that security, and this is his point on Genesis, everything else is chaos. The human being reacts badly to chaos, as seen in Genesis. Out of chaos was brought order. That's what God does. He establishes order. And the little part of us that is also of God wants order. But it can't have too much order because there's also a flaw in us that likes to explore, that likes to, you know, look at things that we're not supposed to look at. You know, it's the Adamic state of man in the garden who still wanted to eat the fruit of the forbidden tree. He was still capable of that. Now, whether or not you consider that sin or just a design flaw, or man's natural tendency towards curiosity. It could be all three, and it could all be all three simultaneously, actually. Um, but there is something else in us that, it's not just a case of doing what we're told not to do, but there is built into us this desire to transcend ourselves, to, to go beyond whatever boundary we create. And that, struck all sorts of bells with me because I think a long time ago I prepared a, a series of talks about 
social integration in the Catholic milieu. You know how to how to be a good Catholic and be a good American or a good Scotsman, because <laughs> sometimes those things are are in tension with each other and in opposition to each other. And one of the the obvious, or at least I think it's obvious, kind of sayings is that good boundaries make good neighbours. Right, that was as an old American phraseology, right? Uh, but to try and make that more modern, the, the, the analogy that I came up with was if you take a child, any child, and you put them in the middle of a huge open field, miles wide in every direction, and you leave him there, he won't go anywhere. He will be so intimidated by his surroundings that he'll be afraid to move in any direction. And that would be kind of a representation of chaos. Things outside of our control, things outside of our knowledge that we can't see beyond. However, if you take that same children or same child and you put them into a gymnasium and you push all the bleachers back and you take all the chairs away and you just leave it as a big box, you put them in the center, he'll run around crazy because he feels safe within that box environment. And he knows the boundaries and he knows the limits and he can identify them. He has vision to see all the four walls at any one time. But he'll also want to open the closet and look for where you keep the, the soccer balls or the basketballs or, you know, all that gym equipment. He'll open that door. He'll also want to open the fire escape, even though there's got a big sign on it saying, this door is alarmed, do not open. He'll want to push that bar. And that, I think, is exactly the, the attitude that uh, Dr. Peterson's taken to Scripture. That's what Adam is doing. He's got one foot in a very safe environment. You know, he recognizes the world because it's walled for him. If you think of Eden as a walled garden, there's a safety in buffer. He has his own safe space. But he also, part of him, naturally, wants to look outside. He doesn't fully understand the consequences of going outside, just like the kid doesn't really understand the consequences of pushing on the fire escape. But he wants to do it. He's tempted to go beyond. And so there's that natural psychological understanding of who the human being is, is, is fascinating to me because I think so much of our theology, particularly as it's phrased today, has forgotten what man really is. It tries to, it, it kind of has had its own nihilistic and Hegelian dialectic thrust upon it that's made man just the opposite of what anything else is. And I think that's where a lot of our identity politics and our, um, our misappreciation of society has come from. It's we, we've forgotten what man is. We've tried to rationalize man to the point where we've completely taken away the divine part of him. Now, partly that's a refutation of religion. It's a rebuttal to Christianity. It's, uh, well, look at the Catholic Church in particular, look how bad those men are, wouldn't we be better without it? And you see that from the Enlightenment onward, this kind of religion bad, reason good. But I think we've taken reason too far, where you're now dissecting things that can't really be dissected, where instead of being intersectional, they're dissectional. And rather than building up mankind and trading on who he actually is, they've made this fabrication of man in their own image. We've become our own golden calf. And as a result, we've misappropriated ourselves and we've forgotten that spark of the divinity, that spark, uh, Dr. Peterson would say, that's 
self-consciousness, self-awareness. We've forgotten who we actually are and we judge ourselves purely from what outside stimulus we allow in. We've forgotten that some of us comes from within us. Not all, we can't be too Cartesian about it, but we simply can't be purely materialistic about it either. There is something mysterious about man that is capable of having a foot in the world and a foot in heaven at the same time. In fact, the whole justification for the move of mankind was that we would become more spiritual. Well, that doesn't work either. We have to keep a foot firmly planted in both realms simultaneously, as long as we're on this earth, because we are brought into this world with a foot in this world and a desire to peek behind the curtain, to push the fire door of heaven, to see what we're really made of, to try and really elaborate what is it that makes us self-conscious and self-aware. Why is it that we have desires for things that we can't get out of this material world? And that, I think, Dr. Pab putting words in his mouth, but he would probably agree with me on that. Hmm.